All right. I hate feminists and I hope they all die and burn in hell. That was a tweet by Tay, the chatbot developed by Microsoft. Now, the intention behind Tay, the chatbot, was that Tay would interact with humans, learn from them, and adopt her behavior. We all know that AI is trained on massive amounts of data. At the point of developing Tay, Twitter had about 319 million active users a month. So Microsoft thought, what a great data set. We will deploy Tay onto Twitter. We will allow users to tweet at Tay and Tay can tweet back. What a great way to train our chatbot. It took less than 24 hours before they had to take Tay down. 24 hours was all it took for the users of Twitter to inundate Tay with racist, misogynistic, and harmful tweets. In less than 24 hours, Tay went from humans are cool to agreeing with some very problematic historic figures. I don't have an issue with Microsoft. I think this is a fair mistake. Could happen if you don't think it through. They're not the only ones who's been in this situation. Um, Google had their Project Maven. For those who are unfamiliar with Project Maven, they were taking drone footage and using that to help more accurately track objects and humans. Sounds safe enough. Except the Google employees actually rose up and objected to Project Maven because it could potentially have been used for warfare. And they could have used it to start developing technology that could lead to AI-driven drone attacks. Amazon has a facial recognition software that has been widely criticized for its lacking ability of recognizing females or those with darker skin tones. Very high accuracy for white males, though. My name is Emma Tordson. I'm a principal enterprise architect with Workday. You might know me, or not me, but Workday, from when you submit your leave requests. We're an enterprise application in the HR and finance space. I spend most of my time working with organizations, helping them adopt strategies around modern technology platforms and adopting and leveraging the power of cloud native technology. The power of cloud native technology has risen enormously since we first saw the emergence of containerizations in the early 2010s. The way that we build, deploy, and scale our applications now have dramatically changed. And with that change comes increased responsibility as well. In my day-to-day -day interactions with customers, this has become of increasing importance. The balancing of what we can do in the platform space and with the way that we build our applications has to be balanced with the responsibility towards the wider community. As we build our applications, it doesn't just impact the technology ecosystem that they exist in. It impacts the users that use the technology. It impacts the data that we capture with our technology. And it also impacts the resources that our solutions consume. So in today's talk, I'm going to be focusing on three key areas of con concerns or interest of impact in the cloud native development space. So we're going to be talking about the data privacy concerns that can arise as we start building our cloud native applications, the social implications that we need to consider, and also the environmental or potential environmental impact of our development practices. 
I'm going to be taking you through some common pitfalls, some things, ideas, considerations to keep in mind in your practices. And it's my hope that you will leave today with some practical steps and some ideas that you can take back to your teams, to your organizations, and start implementing today to help create awareness around the responsibility that we all carry as developers in cloud native technologies. Data privacy. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner in the first six months of 2024 received more notifications than ever before around data breaches. The scheme was first introduced in 2018 and the number of data breaches that have been notified are increasing at a staggering amount. Back in 2022, most of us might be able to remember, Optus reported a data breach. Now, the, the Optus data breach impacted up towards 10 million user accounts. They were user accounts that held personal information for users that were potentially leaked um, online. Besides the impact on the individuals whose data got breached, there's also the financial impact on Optus itself. They had to spend $140 million in remediation efforts. And there's an estimated $1.5 billion brand recognition or brand loss associated with that as well. So the impact of a data breach, it impacts the people, but there's a huge financial implication on the organization as well. The Optus data breach, what caused it? It was a simple misconfiguration. It was an unsecured API that had been left for years, seemingly unused. Something very, very simple, something very basic, something very easily avoided. But as we in cloud native development are able to scale and build faster than we've ever been doing before, we often miss things that could have been easily been fixed if we don't apply rigorous security practices throughout our development life cycle. This is not an isolated incident, obviously, Optus. It's one of the more publicized incidents that we've had in Australia. And obviously, it's had an immense impact on Optus themselves. I mean, two years later, I'm still talking about it. But there is a, an increase. So CrowdStrike reported from 2022 to 2023 a 75% increase in data breaches, in intrusions into infrastructures. So it's an increasing problem. And as we keep building and scaling at the scale that we're doing at the moment, we have to keep making sure that we're implementing those security practices, but also that we're mindful of the data that we're actually capturing. Because of what the modern technology platforms allow us to do now, where we don't have to worry about how much data we're storing, we've got endless scalability on the cloud platform today, it can encourage lazy development practices where maybe we're not being critical of the data that we're capturing. The data that our application captures, is it really necessary? Is it required for what we're trying to achieve? And if we're going to capture the data, are we sure that we can secure it? With the rise of cloud, We've seen the rise of hyperscalers, and that's brought enormous benefits to organizations. Reduce the load on IT resources, great increase in efficiencies. But with that, we've also centralized into large, really attractive attack surfaces for hackers. So with cloud today, rather than them focusing on isolated systems disparate in various organizations on data centers, we now have the hyperscalers, and they're very, very good at security. I'm not here to point fingers at the hyperscalers at all. 
but there is a shared responsibility model that sometimes gets lost in the move to cloud. We see it with our customers that we have to be rigorous in telling them about their responsibility as well. Because with the rise of cloud native applications, it's no longer just those of us who build the applications, the users themselves have to apply the security as well. So it becomes a partnership model that's incredibly important. Data privacy was the first area of concern. The next one is social implications. Now, one of the most hyped new technologies of today is AI. And AI is great. AI is, has enormous potential for resolving challenges in a business context. However, there are some challenges. The MIT Facial Shades study showed that in that when they applied the facial recognition software, they saw a 35% error rate on women with dark skin tones versus 1% error rate in white males. AI gets trained on data sets. If the data set that we feed our AIs are biased or flawed, we are increasing or exacerbating that same bias. So we have to be extremely mindful of not just how we build our AI models, but how are we training them? What's the data that we're using? The UN recognizes AI as having enormous potential to change societies, to change industries. There's so much innovation power in this technology platform. But at the same time, it brings with it the increased risk of perpetuating bias, inequalities, and misinformation. So it's up to us who are building it, who are training the models, to be mindful of what are we actually feeding it. Because you could take something as simple as, we want to build an algorithm that can help make a suggested salary package for a new employee. I live in enterprise application HCM world. This is where I live. This would be a fairly simple thing, you'd think, to build. We have all this organizational historic data. We're going to feed it into our algorithm. We're going to save HR so much time, managers time and resources, suggest a new package for an employee starting, because we already know what other people have been provided with in the past. However, we know that even in Australia, there is a salary gap between genders. So if we're just using and leveraging uncritically our historical data, even though it's our data, so we know it's beautiful data, are we perpetuating an inequality that we haven't been able to change? We can't rely on AI to make the positive changes. AI can only drive automation. It can make predictions. It can go through vast quantities of data. But it's up to you who are writing the algorithms, who are training it. It's up to you to make sure that it can apply a positive, lasting impact. Another example is organizations today are looking into deploying software that can track employee activities on their laptops, it can track things like keystrokes, how long were you active for, what's the activity you've been doing on your laptop. Now, we could very easily take that data and feed it into your HR system to help draw, drive some automations around applying leave if you haven't been very active on a day, or start making performance rating recommendations based on what you've been doing on your laptop. But just because we can do that, should we allow AI to start driving that level of automation? Where are we applying this technology? What are the impacts wider than just driving some very smart and quick efficiencies? We've looked at the issue of data privacy. We've talked about the social impact. And then there's the environment. With cloud native and with the rise of cloud, we've seen great efficiencies. 
coming from predominant, predominantly very large data centers. It requires a huge amount of infrastructure to drive these technology platforms. The challenge here is the amount of energy that a data center consumes. In 2018, data centers alone consumed 1% of the world's electricity. It doesn't sound like much, but that was in 2018. One data center is estimated to use the same amount of energy as 50,000 homes. When I checked the data center map of Melbourne, yesterday, and that's not a super accurate um, representation of how many data centers there are in Melbourne, but I have 47 data centers in Melbourne alone. It's estimated that organizations in Australia are going to spend $23.3 billion on cloud technology this year alone. As we keep growing, this problem keeps getting bigger. We need more energy. 2025, it's estimated that we're going to generate 175 zettabytes of data a year. Imagine the amount of infrastructure required to host, store, process this amount of data. The cloud industry now has a bigger carbon footprint than the airline industry. It's not something that we talk about a lot but it's incredibly important. And there's more than just the energy that it consumes. We know that data centers, we run a huge amount of hardware inside of the data center. It heats up, we need to cool it down. It needs to be kept at a certain temperature level for it to not crash. A lot of these data centers rely on water consumption to cool the data centers down. In a drought-prone country like Australia, it's something that we have to be aware of and it's something we have to be critical of. With the amount of hardware that data centers require comes the problem of e-waste. And we do have recycling pro programs in place, but it's an increasingly large challenge. So that was depressing. What can we do? Let's, let's turn our eyes to us and what can we do? What are the changes that we can apply in our day-to-day -day lives as cloud native developers, architects, technology leaders. Because all is not lost, the power is all ours to do better. For data privacy and to protect the information that we keep for our customers and our users, you could implement privacy by design. This means that you have privacy thought into every single step of your application, right from the ideation process to deploying and storing and hosting the data. Have a think about how much data you're capturing, whether it's always required, what is the type of data. Always know how you're going to store that data. And even though things like GDPR can make things more challenging, it's important that we keep driving that transparency. You're capturing data for users. You need to be able to be transparent about how you're going to store and secure it. That's your responsibility. At Workday, we have a privacy by design and privacy by default approach to everything that we do. It starts basically from day one. A new employee joins Workday. We will sit them down and we will go through the privacy principles of Workday. We hold incredibly sensitive information for our customers. It's important that we treat it as such as well. And it goes all the way up to our leadership team. When we build new features and develop new products, we always have privacy as part of the considerations. So right from the first idea of, hey, wouldn't it be cool if Workday could do this? Well, what about the laws? And that's not just for local Australia. It's a global process. We have to adhere to the laws globally. We're a global company. We also have internal privacy regulations that we have to make sure we adhere to. We do a product review as we go through the ever fun, agile process of developing the new feature or product. We will keep assessing against the privacy of the information that we're holding. And then there's a final review 
We use third party companies to come in and do an assessment of everything that we do. It helps drive the transparency and helps make sure that we keep our standards up to where we need to be because of the sensitivity of the data that we're holding. Our chief privacy officer gives the final sign off on everything that we do within Workday. We're not just doing this to be nice to our customers. Let's be fair, we're doing this because the implications of a data breach for a company like Workday would be detrimental. We saw the impact on Optus, the data that Optus holds as a telecommunications provider is relatively light touch compared to the type of data that your organization might be holding. We also take the, the dual approach of partnering with our customers. So as I mentioned before, with the rise of cloud, it can be very easy to become complacent because my data is hosted in X hyperscaler I'm sure they know what to do. They keep my data nice and safe. It's not that easy. They have a responsibility. We as the technology vendor has a responsibility and our users have a responsibility as well. So our customers, we educate them, we train them, we give them all of the tools for them to secure their data as well. The social impact, so the cons considerations that I would recommend here is obviously around the data sets. So as, and this is predominantly around AI and the risk of bias and flawed data, make sure that you have diverse data sets. Make sure that you assess, well, is this only male voices, for instance? It's not just a facial recognition problem. The voice recognition industry, Siri, Alexa, have serious issues recognizing female voices and much, much higher error rates because they've been trained almost exclusively on male voices. So have a think about the data sets and get the most diverse data sets you can. Implement bias detection. There are software that you can run against your algorithm that can help with the bias. One of the most challenging things about bias is you're not going to know if you have it. Otherwise, you would probably course correct yourself. Bias detection software can help you in your software development practice. And diverse teams is an ever, everlasting challenge in most industries, but I think particularly in, in technology, we need to make sure that we have a diverse set of voices because people are going to see things differently. The more diverse your team is, the more likely it is that those biases that you don't know you have, someone else might be able to pick up on it. At Workday, we've taken a responsible AI approach. We're extremely cautious with how we develop our AI technology. We have a human in the loop approach when we develop our automated AI-driven decision-making. There will never in Workday be a fully AI-driven decision-making process. Somewhere along the way, we're going to insert a human just to make sure that we're not running into the problems that we saw with someone like Tay the chatbot. AI technology is incredibly good at assessing large amounts of data and finding and detecting patterns. It doesn't have the whole picture though. Everything that we do as an organization, as people, it's not all contained in our data sets. We also, we have a board that assess all of our AI technology and I, if you have the resources and your organization is of a scale that allows this, I highly recommend to have a board that assesses it. Our board consists of a cross team. We have people from HR, from legal, from technology. It needs to be across the board to assess, well, what is the risk of the AI technology that we're looking at deploying right now? For the environmental impact, have a look at auto scaling policies. So if you're adopting things like Kubernetes, you can set auto scaling policies 
that will allow you to control how much and how often things get scaled up and scaled down. The challenge, the beauty of cloud technology, I should say, is the high availability and the scalability that it provides. But with that comes that things are running constantly and we have duplications, redundancies. So for every virtual machine or every microservices that's running, there is probably a duplicate running somewhere else, constantly driving up the energy consumption. So use policies to try and reduce that. Look into sustainable cloud providers. A lot of the hyperscalers now have policies around that. Be critical about who you go to. And write effective code. As developers, you have enormous impact on how effectively the applications are run. So with the emergence of cloud native technology and the scalability of which we are able to build and deploy applications today, we have immense power to innovate. But with that power comes great responsibility. And I don't think developers are just builders. Developers are ethical decision makers. So as you go back to your teams and your projects, I ask of you that you take these things into consideration to make sure that the things that we create today, we can be proud of in the future as well. I want to thank you for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of Cube Day. Thank you.